this late at night, I, I can't really talk too loud because I don't like people out, particularly my mother and my father, who are in their 80s. Um, they need all the sleep they can get. Um, I figured out, as I was waking up, I, fig I think I figured out something I noticed whenever I made my VR videos and I had uploaded them to YouTube. Um, if I change the videos to say for it's for kids, then I can't view them. I can't view the videos on the uh, on the VR headset because the VR app says this is for kids. You can't view this with your VR app. I was like, wow, that's strange. Why would should that be? Well, duh, the VR headsets you can't fit upon children. So if you're going to show children's content, the children are not going to be able to see it anyhow because you're doing in a VR setting. And the other thing is, is that um, for some children who have epilepsy, um, you don't want to give them access to that because then it will, it will trigger an epileptic fit. Um, there's probably other reasons for it. Um, and then it hit me the reason why Microsoft didn't release Minecraft for the Oculus Go. They did for the VR, VR but um, is probably the reason why they're probably not going to do it for the go is because it's a large audience and um, the VR headsets you can't fit up on children. Um, you have to be of a certain amount, a certain age, your head has to be a certain size for the VR headset to fit on you. And so they don't want children to get, uh, to really want to use Minecraft on the VR headset because it's really cool sounding. So they don't want the children to start picking up their parents headsets or to even use their parents' headsets to um, look at VR content. Also because when you go to the Oculus Store, you'll notice that they put on the front page adult type content. And that's all there just to discourage parents from giving their VR headsets access to their children because then it permits their children to get into all sorts of trouble. And uh, it's really not for children. It's um, it probably confused them. There's no telling a number of things. So it's possible that Microsoft looked at the VR headsets are not really accessible to any kids uh, under the age of 13 because that's Oculus's point of view. If you go and you look at their, um, when you install the software um, to the VR headset, it starts out with a video and it says 13 plus and that's their age range. So. Basically, you've killed off most of the Minecraft age because most of them are under the age of 13. Um, so, that's probably the reason why there's no Minecraft on the Oculus Go is because the age range is, it doesn't include people under the age of 13 for obvious reasons. That's probably the reason why there's no game for the Oculus Go, as I said. So, um, you put it's because of the age range is probably the reason why Microsoft's limiting it. Um, and YouTube is also following suit. If you deem games for children, um, it's discouraging them, the, the video content, from being put on VR apps so that children don't put on headsets, uh, the parents. Um, just to see. I mean, it makes perfect sense. So. Um, so I had to go through all my videos and say that this is not for kids, you know, and you might even want to age or strip things um, just to keep kids from, uh, keep the parents from putting, even giving kids access to the headsets, you know, add some, uh, add some cussing and sexual window window and all that stuff, put all that stuff in there and uh, it'll discourage the children from having access to the VR headsets. Now, there could be some people that would challenge this and they put their um, kiddo content in a, on in a VR video and then, you know, put it up on YouTube and, you know, it'd be up to YouTube to determine to, to remove it, but uh, they would have no reason to remove it and it would open it up, open up access to the uh, children, you know, to have that kind of content available. But you couldn't say it was not for kids. And that's, I mean, you couldn't say it's, it was for kids. If you said it's for kids, then you lose access to that whole, that whole audience. And so, um, 
that would be a way of protesting if you really believe that there should be VR headsets for children. And that's probably the way to fix that, is to have a whole range of VR headsets for children. And I mean, you could, I don't know if you could make money off of that, but it would be a good way of introducing this uh, genre, this, because um, as you've learned with the iPads, the children are really driving the sales of iPads is, yeah, that's it. And so you can do augmented reality. You can do you can't do the virtual reality um, with with iPads. Um, you can do augmented reality because you can use the camera, so you can point the the iPad at the content, and you can add three D stuff into that environment. You can't do that with um, a VR headset unless you um, unless you make it so that children can look at the content. Another way to do that is probably if somebody was to release a special uh, headset that would adjust the visual content so that it would be accessible to a smaller head, and then you create a whole range of headsets for um, children to, for you know, to put cell phones on or to um, or to adjust the. Um, you know, put you would have to use prisms or something in order to get the content to get down to a smaller eye um, separation, and but then you would have to deal with the children being able to don a, a heavier headset. So there's just a lot of things you run into in making VR accessible to children. Um, there's also probably the level of disorientation. You also don't want to give this to babies because babies haven't completely, un their brains haven't developed to the point to where they can really understand three-dimensional shapes in the first place. That's the reason why a lot of content for for babies um, tends to be two-dimensional, tends to be very simple, sim simplified. You don't use very complex characters. You don't make the characters talk a whole lot, you know that they have to mime a lot of stuff. Um, it is really because babies don't understand English, for one thing. Talking to them is not going to mean anything. Um, the only thing you can do is is make the things cute and make the things um, easy to look at. Animations would be more interesting to a toddler than, you know, something that's three-dimensional and moving around, they don't, they can't make sense of dimension. They don't have enough of perspective on anything because they're, they're, the, the distance between their eyes is, is shorter. And because that distance is shorter, the only thing they can have any three-dimensional perspective on are smaller things. So if you show, um, if you have a baby and he's looking across a room uh, at individuals, he can't, under, he doesn't understand the dimensions. He probably doesn't understand the forms of the people. He can probably understand the faces. Um, he probably can't... Uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that enter into that. He probably can't understand the light differences between uh, shapes. So you, a well-lit room is much better for babies than something that's got darkness and lightness in it. Um, unless you just want to focus them to focus on one person. It's the reason why they put all those objects over the crib is to train their eyes on being able to understand dimensions. Um, but you probably wonder the reason why whenever you look at a mountain far off, it looks flat. But whenever you're in an airplane and you're flying over, it looks three dimensional. It's because your brain doesn't have enough time uh, in, an, in an airplane, it doesn't have enough time to focus in on for both eyes to see the same perspective on that, uh, on that plane. But whenever you're on the ground, both eyes got the same image and they basically don't, they can't see around the mountain. So as a result, the mountain looks flat. You get it. It'll it'll look more three dimensional as you spread the eyes apart. I've done these tests myself um, using a camera, making the left and the right eyes separate from each other. And so you take one photograph, then you move about fifteen feet off to the right and take the other photograph, 
you put the two together and everything looks, the mountains look three-dimensional, whereas you can't focus on anything that's nearby. And so that's what you lose, is you lose the ability to focus on things that are close up, but you can see things that are three-dimensional uh, on a very large scale. The same is true is if you bring the, 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 the separation of the eyes together, and then you add the element of making those lenses smaller, and then they, you make them such that they can only look at things that are close up, and, but you can't see things further out, then you gain the ability to see very, very small things in three dimensions. And you see, you can't look at three dimensional small stuff with a, a VR camera because um, it, the separation between the eyes is too great to look at itsy bitsy things. And if you look at it from far off, then you need more resolution. So the solution to that problem is to make special cameras just for bugs and just for really small creatures. What you gain from that is the ability to see creatures as if they were gigantic. So you could look at a hamster and the hamster would look like the size, it would look the, like it was the size of a longhorn um, cow, you know, of a longhorn. And, or it would be the size of an elephant. You can make the hamster the size of an elephant by decreasing, by making the lenses and the, the whole, it does, the camera doesn't have to be, yeah, it does have to be smaller. It'd probably have to use fiber optics with, um, with fisheye lenses, or it would have to be just a smaller camera, not just fiber optics. It might not use fiber optics. It'd just be a really small camera and then, you know, use it the way that it would probably be useful to doctors so they could see things in throats in three dimensions. You know, you can't see, when they st stick that little thing down your throat, they're looking at it in one dimension. They're not looking at it in three dimensions. If they're looking at three dimensions, that's something they didn't mean. And that's probably, that would be something that would be really good in bringing a different kind of reality to people with VR headsets. That would make VR headsets special apart from all other cameras and that you could see things in three dimensions at a very small size. The other cameras could also come along for the ride, but you see, we need to make cameras smaller so that we can look at really small stuff. And then you have a venue, I mean, then you have a um, subject matter that nothing else can match, you know, the, that people will find fun um, looking at their they, they will go and they'll take the camera and they'll put it in their hamster cage and watch the hamsters go around, especially if the frame rate's really fast on these on these cameras, then you could you just give a lot of light into the hamster cage. Hopefully the hamster doesn't get blinded. You make the frame rate really fast so that um, so that you can see the hamsters running slower and then um, you uh, then you're able to look at the cancers, the hamsters, hamsters, the hamsters through your headset, and you'll see three-dimensional dinosaurs walking by slowly rather than super fast. That's the reason why you want to have a faster frame rate and stereo. And so faster frame rate stereo, being able to look at hamsters as if they're dinosaurs walking by really slow instead of zooming by. You don't see a blur as they move past. You see them you know, really, that was the reason why the Star Wars movies were so effective um, in the beginning is, is that they would do all of these um, attacks with the, all these um, things, um, doing it one image at a time at a very slow rate, and then they'd have all those um, models controlled with, um, with uh, computers. They controlled the, the camera with the computer and they controlled the models with the computer. They could do both or just one. It actually doesn't matter. Um, you just need one movie. So you move the camera uh, or you move the model. And they had the capacity to do that in the 70s. And when it became available, that's what separated Star Wars from all the other flicks that were doing 3D stuff. At the, I mean, doing... Um, um, space wars at the time is that they couldn't compete 
with what Lucas was doing with these computer controlled cameras on these models. And, and that's what made the models look real is um, the is the is what he was doing was his slow moving camera and um, all the effects that were added on top of that were just uh, compositing. You know, so you didn't do the explosions in space that way, but they also videotape, I mean, they also film the explosions at a very slow rate so that they, so they could explode something really small and then it would look really big because it was running slower. So they had to, um, it's possible that the explosions had to be filmed at a faster rate, but not too fast because then you couldn't, it, observe the um, the lightness and but you would have to adjust that as well so you could probably do that i don't know um but that's the problem you run into whenever you increase the frame rate is you actually have to increase the uh, brightness of what you're looking at because um, you're not going to get a whole lot of light into the camera in order to um in order to composite that image unless the array somehow is able to collect the light correctly but then your ray has to be denser because then it has to increase the amount of photons um, that are hitting the ray. That would probably be the reason why you can't make the camera smaller is, is the size of the CCD. Um, but my dad said to me that as you decrease the size of the CCD, your, um, your lens pack also has to decrease in size. And the size of the lenses have to decrease in size. So everything has to decrease in size or in order for you to get the same effect. However, if you decrease the size, then it's possible that the, um, the amount of light needed to hit the array is probably, it's either increased or decreased. Um, so I, I don't know where, where to go with that, but um, if you need more light, then you would just use a larger lens, but you can't do that for this content. So. Um, you would, you would have to figure, you couldn't do fast frame rates maybe. So that would be a, that would be a humdinger to try to figure it out. However, if you created an entire array of lenses with an entire array of CCDs at a smaller size and then created it like a sphere, then, um, you could collect, you, you could actually get more dimension out of it, but yeah, that's something to think about. That, that would be something to present somebody like Jeff Bezos who would probably jump on th such things, you know. Um, it's probably an area they haven't even explored with, um, with um, uh, in space was to see um, the effects of, um, of gravity on bugs and to see it in 3D and to see it at the rate of the bugs to see actually what it would do to their uh, tactile abilities with the surface of the ground or whatever it is they're trying to do. Of course, you couldn't do that, but you could if you put centrifuges on them and then you could see if the bugs would behave in a centrifugal world um, the way that we expect in all of our models on doing um, spinning stuff because if you put anything in space and you want to simulate um, gravity, you have to spin it. That's the reason why they create those those disc, those kinds of round tubular things. Um, why they have to be tubular rule wor worlds whenever you're putting stuff into space is because you can't simulate gravity unless you were sp spinning a globe and then putting people on it just like you're doing with the earth but the thing is there is they put a great mass in the center and you know that mass is is much more dense and that's how you get the gravity with the planet the only way you can get that kind of gravity is by spinning things around which is um in how that works is um as you spin something around the force of the item is that's on the inside of the wheel is being forced to go in one direction. And as it's doing that, it's trying to, it, it starts off going one direction, then the thing catches it. 
And so they end up being upright um, inside of that circle because the force is always going, is trying to go in the direction that the ground is trying to push it. And eventually you just end up being upright and, and your perspective changes because your um, the, the things in your ears that tell you what's up, what's right side up and what's, you know, upside down, which is uh, based on gravity, um, will make you feel like you're right side up and then the earth will, actually the earth will change position as you're going around. So you might be able to determine what time of the day it is by, or what minute it is by where the earth is. Um, you have to be go going, it has to be fairly big. The, the um, wheel in the sky would have to be fairly big and it'd have to be going fairly fast, um, fast enough that it's, that your body, that you get a certain gravitational pull. That's how you get higher gravity is by the speed of that spin. And so to, to keep people from getting dizzy because they're gonna look at the earth and it's gonna be flying around. If you make a smaller, um, a smaller one of those, you could probably get the same amount of gravity pull and that would probably be great for a first test is to have a smaller one of those and put people in and spinning it around. And, um, but it'd have to spin really fast. And if you had it exposed, which is probably what would have been, you know, grounds to make it uh, the 2001 Space Odyssey pretty um, correct is to not give you a perspective on the space outside, which is something you could do um, you don't want to do that in a, a world like that because if you sp increase the speed, the Earth and the whole space is just going to be flying around you and it'll be confusing. However, if you're in New York City, you'll notice that your brain just cuts off the dimension of the high buildings over you. You're not going to be concerned about it. It only becomes a concern when you get out of the cab uh, you came off the airplane, airplane you, get, you get into the cab, you come out of the cab, and then you get this sort of temporary shell shock that, oh, my goodness, there's buildings over me, I'm going to get crushed. And then somehow your brain just adjusts to it, and you're just like, oh. And all you see is everything two or three stories up. You don't even focus on things that are above you. And, you know, this, that's something you could try with the VR headsets. Um, with VR cameras, run them through the city and then just aim them up a little bit higher so you can see the street, but then you can see the buildings above and see how long it takes for people's eyes to adjust to the fact that the things above don't really matter and the stuff that's on the street does. I think part of the reason why that works with the, with the, um, what the uh, human observer is observing has to do with um, the amount of distance between them and the stuff that's above them is eventually your your brain's just going to see everything above you as being basically flat and it's going to be three-dimensional because you're walking past it but it's going to basically look flat and so your brain just focuses on stuff that is three-dimensional the stuff that's moving above that is not all that three-dimensional it just blocks off because it understands it doesn't make any and you're not going to be going up there anyhow. But if you did that in space, then you have the capacity to go up the sides of buildings and, you know, you might have the capacity you would. Actually, you would. Um, you get the gravitational pull only if you're on the ground. But if you, if you um, started to try to climb a building, um, then... Then you probably would fall. I don't know, but you could you could jump up, and if and nothing would bring you down. There would be no gravitational pull. That's only true if you're on the surface of the of the wheel. If you jump up, then the wheel's going to move out from under you and probably at a fairly fast rate. So they need to do experiments before they can even say that they could do things like that. To have these wheels in space and have the gravitational pulls that they they're wanting because that I don't think they've done the test that they've actually looked at things that also to see what it would do to bugs, what it would do to animals, 
And so they need to be doing this with small models before they can even say that they're going to try to occupy space. Now they could probably occupy Mars, but then there's cases where they need to do things like that, like maybe putting little itsy bitsy spacemen out there uh, with AI and then probably a good reason to push AI is so that you can put the AI on the uh, on these little spaceships that you send to Mars and then the AI will deal with um, the information there and you can have the AI like try to describe behaviors of things that it experiences while it's in space. So you give the AI a certain amount of intelligence and that intelligence may be the intelligence of a, of a 10 or 12 year old if you can achieve that. Um, you could achieve the, the 10 or 12 year old observational but without having to understand anything else about um, about reality like you know the differences between um, between animals and humans and things like that because you're not going to see them so you just give it the understanding of how to you know very simple things and you could give it the understanding of a 12 year old probably wouldn't be able to talk to you like it was a 12 year old but it would still be able to collect and um, and describe behavior that it sees around it. So you give it a limited behavior of a certain age professional and you put it up there on Mars and that and it will see things from um, a basic human's point viewpoint and from a professional viewpoint and then it'll be able to bring back that information in a way that uh, that, that can be understood. So. Uh, you know, every time I put these videos up, I'm just sitting there thinking on the fly. But I tend to think a little bit of, uh, outside of the box. And so hopefully it gets out there. Somebody listens to it. You know, I don't know.